All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning we will be discussing kindness in our Fruit of the Spirit study. Uh, and before we get into that, I want to hammer home the point that I've been hammering in like every opportunity I, I get, uh, which is that the Fruit of the Spirit is not the result of our own human efforts, but the result of the power of God's Spirit in us. This is not about behavior modification just so that we can function better in life. It's about complete heart transformation by the grace and the love of Jesus on the cross for our sins. And I want to show you that point again this morning, but I want to do it in a unique way to help you get thinking even more deeply about this subject. Before we get into that, though, let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we praise your name. Thank you so much for Jesus, for showing us your glory on the cross, for showing us you are indeed a God uh, who is slow to anger, who is compassionate, who is lovingly kind to people who don't deserve it. We're so grateful for your kindness. We pray, God, that we will be intentional and we'll look around us and see who we can show that same kindness to in our lives so that they can come to know your kindness through us and come to Jesus as well for salvation. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us when we fail to be kind. Help us to always strive to be more like Jesus with each day that passes as we develop these uh, fruits of the Spirit in our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you turn to Genesis chapter 2, please. Genesis chapter 2. You can keep a marker in Galatians. Obviously, we'll be, we'll be back there in a bit. But um, Genesis 2 is the kind of the zoomed in account. Genesis 1 is the zoomed out account of creation. And then Genesis 2 zooms in uh, specifically on human beings because we're the crown of his creation. And so in Genesis 2 and verse 7, it says, The Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, it's important to remember the word for breath is the same word for spirit in Hebrew. And so in some contexts, God's breath and spirit can be used interchangeably. Now, I want to ask some rhetorical questions for us to consider. You don't actually have to answer them, but just think about them. What is the source? According to this verse, what is the source of man's life? Where does our life originate? Now, the material of our bodies originates from the earth and you know we come from the dust but but I, I mean what actually gives us life well it's God's breath or God's spirit the dust could not give life to itself the dust is dead it, it needs the spirit of God to to animate it and give give it life um, now, my second question is not about origination, but about what sustains our life. We've seen that the source of our life is God's Spirit. That's what gives us life. But do you also see in this text that it's God's Spirit that sustains our life? In other words, we, we not only come alive by God's Spirit initially, but we stay alive by God's Spirit continually. So in Ecclesiastes, when he describes what it's like to die, he says it this way. In Ecclesiastes 12, if I can get the clicker to participate this morning. I think our battery is getting low here. Uh, there we go. Fourth time's a charm. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So God's spirit not only gives us life, it sustains our life so that when, when that spirit is no longer in us, we are dead. Uh, James 2, verse 26 says, The body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. This is the point he makes there. Now, even though we can't see our breath, even though we can't see our spirit, this is a, a physical example because it, it's relating to what gives life to our physical bodies. But what God does in the Bible is he uses the physical life that his spirit gives our bodies and draws a parallel to the spiritual life his spirit can give to our souls. So when we sin, the Bible calls that death. But it's not physical death, right? We didn't just you know, drop dead immediately when we sin. But 
We're, we're dead. Our, it's like our souls have died. We, we are spiritually dead. But then in the prophets, God promises that one day he's going to give us new spiritual life. And it's going to be a parallel to what happened in Genesis chapter 2 with our physical bodies. It'll just be more spiritual in nature. So, for instance, Ezekiel, he, he sees a vision of a valley. And this valley is filled with dry bones, just complete death all around him. And that represents the, the nation of Israel, that they're dead spiritually. There is absolutely no spiritual life in them whatsoever. And yet God promises in Ezekiel 36 that one day he's going to send his spirit and then he elaborates on it in chapter 37, and he says, Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, he's going to breathe his breath into his people, and they will live again spiritually. And this first started to be fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people were baptized into Christ, receiving the gift of God's Holy Spirit, or breath. And by the power of Christ's sacrifice on their behalf, they now have new spiritual life in them. And now, when you look at Acts 2, we can ask the same two questions that we asked of Genesis 2. Number one, where did their spiritual life originate? What gave them life in Acts 2? Was it the result of their own human efforts? Well, I mean, they had to respond by getting baptized, right? by believing and getting baptized and repenting. But it wasn't on the basis of anything that they did. They were spiritually dead. They, they were just, spiritually speaking, dry bones who could do nothing for themselves. It was only by the grace of God that by the power of Jesus' sacrifice, he would then send his spirit to, to reanimate them and give them new life so that they could be born again. And what sustained their life? Was it their own efforts? Could they roll up their sleeves and say, well, we're going to work hard enough so that we'll be good enough for God, and then you know, God will accept us in heaven because we did it ourselves? Of course not. No, by their by their own strength and power, they would still give in to the desires of the flesh, right? Remember there's that battle going on, right? And sometimes we lose that battle and we give in to the flesh. By their, by their own strength, they're going to give in to the flesh. And so they need and we need the constant grace of God to keep us alive spiritually by His Holy Spirit. Now, if you can understand this imagery, you will understand why Paul is writing Galatians. Because he's dealing with Jews who are saying, we don't need Jesus' sacrifice at all. Translation, we don't need the Holy Spirit at all. We can just roll up our sleeves, follow the law of Moses, be good enough Jews so that God will be pleased with us. And some Christians are even buying into this nonsense in Galatians. And so listen to Galatians 3. Let's go to Galatians 3. At what Paul says to them, I think this will click for you <clears throat> when you see this big picture that I'm setting up for you. In Galatians 3, Paul asks them questions, verses 2 and 3. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? See that? He's saying, where did your spiritual life originate? Did, did you receive the new spiritually animating breath of God by your own works and your own good deeds? No. Of course not. It came from their faith in Jesus. So he's saying to them, if your spiritual life originated from the Spirit and not by your own works, why in the world would you think that you can then sustain your life without the Spirit? <laughs> that you can, yeah, okay, I was born again by the power of the Spirit, but now I don't need the Spirit anymore, and I'll just go do my own thing. It's, it would be like a baby, right? When a baby is born, is the ba 
is the baby born by anything that the baby did? You know, did the baby have any strength to give birth to itself? No, the baby didn't even give life to itself, right? That's the mother and the father's job, and then the mother does all the hard work, right, of actually bringing that baby into the world, and then even after the baby's in the world, well, then they, they still got to take care of it. The baby still is, you know, totally reliant on the parents, can't do anything. But can you imagine if, let's say, at five years old, that child says, you know what, I don't need mom and dad anymore. I'm, I'm going to go out and be on my own. I'll be fine. That's absurd. He still needs the ones that gave him life. He can't do it on his own at five years old, right? And so Paul is, he's trying to say this to the Galatians. God gave birth to you by his power and his spirit. And now you think you don't need his power or his spirit and you can just do it all by yourself now? Take yourself the rest of the way? That's absurd. And now look in Galatians 5, Galatians 5, verse 25. And this takes us to our context of the fruit of the Spirit, I've been trying to kind of like explain the verses around the, the context of the fruit of the Spirit so that it kind of deepens our understanding of what's going on in context. He says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. In other words, we're only alive because of God's Spirit. That's how we live. We, we live by God's Spirit. And since the Spirit of God gives us spiritual life, and sustains our spiritual life, doesn't it make sense that we should strive to follow the teachings of the Holy Spirit in His Word? <laughs> doesn't it make sense that, that we would want the Holy Spirit to be the source of our guidance and, and our power and our strength in this life, of course? If the Spirit gives and sustains our life, why on earth would we, would we follow our flesh and think that we can just live by the flesh apart from God's Spirit? It, it just doesn't make any sense. And so this brings us back around to my favorite point, <laughs> our main point, that these fruits of the Spirit are being produced in us, not by our own fleshly effort and power, but by the power of God's Spirit working in us and through us as we draw closer to God in relationship, as we connect to Him in, in prayer, in reading His Word, and obeying the teachings of the Holy Spirit in His Word. Any questions or comments about any of that? I know that was a lot. <clears throat> Raise your hand. We can get a mic to you if you have a question. <clears throat> All right. Well, <laughs> I can never tell if there's no questions because it was confusing or no questions because uh, it was perfectly clear, but I'll go with the latter. And you can come to me later if you need clarification. All right. Well, now with that in mind, let's get into kindness. How would you define or describe kindness? Uh, in this case, the Greek lexicons weren't really that much help. I mean, they would just give like little one word things like, oh, well, kindness is goodness. Okay, thank you. That's very, you know, well, one, one said it's benignity. All right, great. It's benign. Like it, it's almost like niceness. Like, I mean, come on, give me something more robust, right? And so sometimes Greek lexicons can be helpful and they, they will give you some robust answers, but then you also have to actually go and look at all the passages where that, that word is used if you want to try to get a deeper understanding in context of how this word is, is being used. And so the definition I've uh, come up with here is, and I mentioned this in the Lord's Supper, though I didn't do a great job articulating it, uh, tender, sensitive, compassionate consideration to take care of those in need. Did anybody have anything different, any nuance uh, to that definition that you wanted to add? Will? <clears throat> Giving care in general. <clears throat> um, without really feeling sorry for them. Like, it could be anything. Just like the smallest things, feeling care towards them. Okay. Rather than compassion towards um, a bad situation. Okay. Yeah, so kindness doesn't have to be something huge. right? Jesus has even a cup of cold water in, in my name. Right? It's an act of kindness. All right. Anybody else on the definition part? Okay, Brenda. Uh, I had friendly, generous, considerate, Good. selfless, merciful, yeah. and then it had compassion too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, you know, it's always it's hard to find you know a succinct definition because there are so many different synonyms and words that we could use, but yeah, those are all great. Sometimes just, just gathering a collection of words right, that are similar uh, can help us understand you know, the meaning better. All right, well, how about this one? Uh, what are some Bible examples where kindness is exemplified? 
what did you guys get for that? And I have another speech that I'm going to launch into after this. So, <laughs> All right, Charlotte. Um, I think a classic one is um, the Good Samaritan. All right, yeah. That's, that's something that even non-Christians could usually point out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good. Yeah, he sees this man in need. He's beaten on the side of the street. He's sensitive to the situation, and he's compassionate. Yes, ma'am. Um, Tabitha or Dorcas, who he, made clothes for people. Yeah, and yeah, really good. Yeah, Acts 9, right, when Dorcas passes away, uh, one of the things they kind of remembered about her at her funeral was her many acts of kindness and charity. So, man, how cool would that be, right? At your funeral, people gather around to talk about how kind you are or how kind you were to people in your life. That's amazing. Yeah, Randy. And memory is a little faint, but... There was a time, I believe, when David fed and took care of his enemy. Okay, yeah, Mephibosheth. And that's the one that I'm going to go, go into a speech about. I really love that example. We're going to look at that in more detail. Yeah, so yeah. Ruth and Boaz. Yeah, Ruth and Boaz, absolutely. You know, you, you have Ruth, who's kind to Naomi. Right? She stays with Naomi, even though she, her future prospects didn't really look that great. It took a lot of faith, you know, to do that. Uh, but then Boaz, he's kind to Ruth, right? He, he takes her in, he feeds her, he you know, gives her what she needs and, and ends up marrying her and, and blessing her in that way. So, yeah, a lot of kindness in, in the book of Ruth. Yes, Sir John. <clears throat> well, the woman caught in adultery, the kindness Jesus showed to her. I know it's cheating to cite Jesus as the example oh, no. <laughs> of kindness in Bible class. Yeah, Jesus wins every time. I, but I, we all know that. <laughs> I mean, not only did he prevent her death, but when she you know, came up to him, he, if I recall correctly, he said, you know, where are your accusers, those people condemning you? Mm -hmm. You know, where, well, neither do I condemn you. Go yeah. your way, sin no more. Definitely. I'm sure she never forgot that the rest of her life. Oh, yeah, absolutely, because he, he, and that, that's that uh, merciful part of kindness, right? That, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe she did deserve death in that moment, but Jesus looked around, and he said, who else here doesn't deserve death? I mean, that's not what he said. He said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. But that's really what he's saying, right? Yeah, you're right, Pharisees. This woman deserves death. So do you. So whoever doesn't deserve death, go ahead and kill her. Be the first one. And I love it. It says, it says the first ones to leave the room were the oldest. Because <laughs> the, the ones who've been on this planet longer, enough, longer than everybody else they know how sinful they are. They know how deserving of death they are. The young people, eh, you know, it's, it's rare, but you, know, you do find humble youth, but a lot of times young people you know, aren't aware you know, of how, how sinful they've been. Uh, and so the, the old people are the first to leave, and then the rest kind of file out after them <laughs> in shame. So yeah, love that. Love that account. Did I see somebody else with a mic? Okay, John's got I got gotcha. you. Okay. All right, any other, any other examples? All right, Brenda's got a hand down here, John. And then Charlotte. Go ahead, Charlotte. <clears throat> oh, me first? Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Okay. Um, this is kind of an out there example, but I, I think an example of kindness being buddy was um, Saul's transformation. Because, mm. um, okay. you know, he came from this cruel, wicked man doing all these evil things, and then kindness was shown to him in like a not in the way that you might expect but um mercy was shown and i'd, I'd say kindness and exemplified of uh forgiveness yeah i think that was an effect of kindness that we see in the bible absolutely yeah i mean uh god's forgiveness anytime he offers forgiveness that's, that's a tremendous act of kindness and paul even says in romans 2 doesn't the doesn't the kindness of god lead you to repentance <laughs> it, it does when you understand how kind god's been to you it's like yeah i want to change i want to be a different person and so god's kindness absolutely transfer transformed saul's life so saul's heart from the inside out all right brenda well i i looked up kindly actually i was looking for kindness and it showed where kindly was coming up anything okay. that was similar and Genesis 50, Joseph speaks kindly to his brothers who are afraid, and it uses the word kindly. Okay. And each of the examples that that 
search came up with, it was all about speaking. So and so spoke kindly. Good. It wasn't necessary. Well, they did things too, but it was the kindness of their speech that soothed the situation. Yeah, that's really good. And also, uh, let's see, Second Kings 25 and 28, the king, uh, evil Meridak, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. he released Jehoiachin and mm. kindly had him at his table for the rest of his life. Yeah. And this enabled, you know, Jesus to come eventually. Yeah, yeah, really good. Yeah, and you know, how kind of God to like to allow mm -hmm. the you know Jehoiachin to survive that and preserve Jesus's lineage yeah really really amazing yeah and and the proverbs they play on this a lot this idea that you brought up of using kindness in our words to build people up to encourage people to speak life into their situation when they feel like death is all around them um, yeah really powerful uh, I want to show you a couple of interesting things Look in Psalm 136. You guys have, may have seen this just in your own you know, personal studies. In some ways it gets difficult to read because it's so repetitive, but it's very fascinating. I, just, I think it's a really neat, neat psalm. But you'll see that there's a pattern in every single verse. In, in every single verse, the first half of the verse says something about God and his praiseworthiness and all that. And then the second line says, for his loving kindness is everlasting. So verse two, give thanks to the God of gods for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who alone does great wonders for his loving kindness is everlasting. So 26 times, you know, that's repeated. So like I said, it, it gets kind of hard to read. Like, it's like okay, I, I get it. But do you get it? You know, the, I, I have to stop myself and think, like, this is really repetitive. This is hard to kind of read through. It's like, it's repetitive for a purpose. He's trying to hammer home this point over and over again that God's loving kindness is everlasting. It's amazing. And, it, and that loving kindness, that's a key word, harkens back to Exodus 34 that we just studied about this morning. That That, that is the, the character of God, this slow to anger, compassionate, abounding in loving kindness. Uh, it's just, we, we have to get that into our into our hearts and minds, and that psalm is a great way to, to do that. Okay, well, then, let me get into Mephibosheth. All right, let's look in 2 Samuel 9. 2 Samuel 9, love this example. This is a, such a great example of kindness by David here. <clears throat> so, you know, Saul, Saul's been defeated. You know, Saul's dead. Jonathan's dead. And this is what happens in 2 Samuel 9. Look in verse 1. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Then if you drop down to verse 3, the king said, Is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, Well, there is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So it turns out Saul has a grandson. It's Jonathan's son. His name is Mephibosheth, and he was crippled because he was dropped as a child. Uh, when Saul and Jonathan died, the nurse that was watching over Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth fled in fear, and she ran with it and dropped him. And presumably his ankles broke when, when he fell. He was, he was five years old, and he just fell wrong, and his ankles broke, and they didn't ever reset you know, properly. So he's, he's totally crippled. His dad is dead. His uncle is dead. All his uncles are dead. Actually, he's got multiple uncles. Uh, they're all dead. The text says nothing about his mother. We actually don't know where his mom is. I, maybe I missed it in my studies, but I don't know where his mom's at. And David essentially adopts Mephibosheth as his son and says, you can live with me and you can eat from the king's table for the rest of your life. You see that in verse 7. David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show loving kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul. You shall eat at my table regularly. And drop down to verse 11. Then Zeba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Now, I, I want to help you guys appreciate, here's my speech, <laughs> the significance of this. 
by reminding you that many books in the Old Testament serve an apologetic function. When I say apologetic, I don't mean they're saying they're sorry. Uh, I mean apologetic in the sense of the Greek word apologia, which means defense. So a lot of books in the Old Testament serve a defensive function. So for instance, the, the books of First and Second Kings are a defense of God's character because historically Israel was destroyed by Assyria and Judah was destroyed by Babylon. So you know what all the Gentile nations would say about God? He's weak. He couldn't, he couldn't stop the Babylonian gods and the Assyrian gods from destroying his people. He, he must not be stronger than the other gods. So his character is under attack. And guess what? The Jews, who weren't really alive at that time, but who maybe in future generations, when the Jews heard that God let his own people be destroyed, let his own temple be destroyed. Guess what they would do? They would attack God's character. You know, if he was really faithful to us, if, if God really cared about his people, he would have never let that happen. How could, how could a loving God, how could a faithful God to his covenant allow his people to be destroyed by Babylon and Assyria? Well, First and Second Kings defends God's character by making it crystal clear the reason all that happened is not because God is weak, it's not because God is unfaithful. It's because his people were unfaithful to him. They sinned against him, kindled his righteous wrath and justice, and it was all an act of punishment on a sinful nation. Um, one of the key chapters for this defensive position is 2 Kings 17. I'll just pull a couple verses from there. This all came about because the sons of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God. And so the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. Almost this whole chapter is a detailed description of all their sins that they committed, all the horrible things they did wrong. And that's why God allowed the Assyrians and the Babylonians to destroy them. He didn't get defeated by them. He let them destroy his people as an act of punishment, as an act of um, justice, really. Well, the books of First and Second Samuel serve as a defense of David's royal dynasty, and by extension, a defense of Jesus' kingship, because he descended from David. How? Well, it's because there was a change in dynasties from Saul's family to David's. And do you realize, historically, dynasties don't change families? That's a really weird thing to happen. A dynasty is meant to be passed down within the same family from one generation to the next, right? Usually you don't have a descendant in that dynasty say, you know what, I don't, I don't really want to be king, and so I'm, let's just give this to a different family. <laughs> like, all right, let's give our royal dynasty away to somebody. That just does not happen. People want to retain power. Historically, traditionally, whenever a dynasty changes families, it's because a fan, someone rises up and usurps the throne and murders the current dynasty, wipes out their entire genealogy. And you know what happens? That creates a tremendous division because you have people in the nation who were loyal to the old king, who were loyal to the old dynasty, and who thinks the new king is completely illegitimate because he just he usurped the throne and, and he you know, committed this horrible crime of, of murdering everybody on the, on the throne in the other dynasty. So do you see how First and Second Samuel defend against that kind of thinking? These books show us the reason the dynasty switched families is because Saul sinned against God. And so God punished Saul for his sin by removing the kingship from his family and giving it to David, a guy who, by the way, didn't even want the kingship really, right? David didn't choose the kingship. God, God gave it to him because he was a man after God's own heart. And David did not murder Saul's family. He treated Saul's family with kindness. Look at the relationship he had with Jonathan, Saul's son, right? Jonathan was the next heir to the throne. If, if David should be threatened by anybody, it would be Jonathan. He'd want to kill Jonathan. But instead, he's kind. They make a covenant. They love each other. And now, even after 
Jonathan is dead and Saul is dead, Saul still has a, a rightful heir, Mephibosheth. And if David's plan was, I need to snuff out Saul's family so I can take this throne, he would have killed Mephibosheth, but instead he treats him with kindness. And so here's how all this is practical. Kindness can serve an apologetic function in our lives as well. That someone may try to spread a false rumor about our character, or they might accuse us of evil motives, but our kindness proves them wrong. That's what happened with Jesus. They put him on a cross. Why? Because they thought he was a low-life criminal who deserved death. But when, especially like the Roman centurion that was putting him to death, when he saw Jesus' kindness to, to his crucifiers, when he saw him asking for their forgiveness, you have to understand how rare that was. In the first century, when people were crucified, they were cussing out the crucifiers. They were lobbing whatever hatred you know, they could, whatever a little amount of power they felt they had left in them, even from the cross, they would make sure to let their crucifiers know, you know, they're the ones that are right. Not, Jesus didn't do any of that. He treats them with kindness. He's silent as a lamb to the slaughter. And by the way that he died, that Roman centurion knew truly this was the Son of God. Jesus' kindness became a defense of his character. David's kindness became a defense of his kingship, ultimately a defense of Jesus' kingship because it showed David's kingship is legitimate. He is the legitimate lineage through which Jesus can, can come. Any questions or comments about any of that, Randy? <clears throat> It made me think that, you know, people who are not godly, who don't have the spirit, they're consumed with obtaining power. But we understand that all power is in God's hands. We're not consumed with that. And that's what allows us to be kind to people. We're not in fear of losing power. It's not ours anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's what First and Second Samuel are showing us. David is a man led by the spirit of God not by fleshly power grabs and all the nonsense that Saul was interested in and what most kings are interested in. He was a humble person, and so God exalted him for that. Yeah, really good. All right, well, how about some modern-day examples of kindness? Modern-day examples, what do you think about that? <clears throat> I can wait longer than you. <laughs> All right, Will. <laughs> I think I may have made uh, the person guilty when I did this, but one time my mother and I um, were exiting a bookstore. Mm -hmm. I had a chocolate bar, um, and someone was begging for something. I don't know if it was money in particular. But when I heard him say that he wasn't eating enough, um, my mother said that I just straight up grabbed through the bag of purchased items and offered him my bar. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's, that's, a, very, that's a very good act of kindness. Yeah, Emery? I was thinking about the, um, the families that, are, that were leaving Ukraine and the, the, the families in Eastern Europe that were saying, you can live with us as long as you need to. Mm. Just opening up their homes for these other families. Yeah, really, really great. Uh, John Savannah's got one down here. And then, go ahead, John. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I heard recently was um, in the terrible school shooting massacre that happened just recently here in Texas, uh, an anonymous donor stepped up and paid for all the funeral costs for all the families wow. for their kids. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm. Savannah? The, ways, the way the Israelis were treated after Hitler had conquered everyone and mm, hurt okay. everyone. Yeah, so 
Yeah, another example of like a refugees from from war. From war, yeah. You just compassion, right? Tender consideration. Herb's got a hand here. <clears throat> I'll tell one while the mic's getting around Herb. Um, I read about a preacher in Romania who was imprisoned and tortured uh, by the communist regime. And he was thrown into a prison cell with a bunch of other prisoners who, who were being tortured as well. It was just freezing in that prison cell. And so all he's got is a blanket that he's just clutching onto, trying to get you know whatever warmth he can from this blanket. And he looks over and he sees another prisoner huddled up on the floor and he has no blanket at all he's just shivering and he ended up giving that man you know his blanket like the only thing that he had for warmth is like, man so powerful i'll say something else about that same example later uh, this morning but her it seems like you've already indicated kindness and forgiveness seem to be linked um i think so i have not read the book but uh, my wife, who's been known to read one or two books, um, <laughs> has shared with me something uh, about an author named Corey Ten Boom. Mm -hmm. And if you know her, she was in Amsterdam during World War II. And she was not Jewish, but she harbored Jews, protected them from, uh, mm -hmm. from the Germans. And when they discovered what they had done, they, they took all of her family and uh, put them in, I don't know if it was Dachau or where, but... Uh, uh, I think she alone survived, is that right, Trish? And she uh, spent a few years trying to f process that and eventually went and found one of the German guards at her prison and said, I, f I forgive you. I, 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 can, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to process that. Yeah. That's... The unspeakable uh, suffering oh, that sure. she had endured with her sister as well. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's a remarkable act of kindness that was undeserved. You know. Angela? So there's two words I say to the kids at school a lot, be kind. Um, something I would like to see more on school campuses because kids these days can be pretty cruel to one another. Um, but I have seen situations where uh, someone has been bullied and then gone and told the other person, even without the person saying they were sorry, that they forgave them and um, try to go out of their way to be kind to that person, just try to create a friendship where uh, it was a difficult situation. So um, there's a lot of opportunities that I have seen uh, where people have been kind. And I think when someone um, is maybe perceived as the underdog or is different, that when others can be kind to them and show them compassion, we don't ever know what anybody is going through. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't always know situations. Um, and that can be the same even with our church family. You know, We don't know yeah. everyone's situation, and kindness can go a long way, that showing compassion to someone. Um, we just don't know. Yeah, no, that's a really, really good example. Jared? In 2019, our son Brock was in the hospital for about four weeks <clears throat> mm -hmm. okay. because of uh, complications with his appendicitis. Okay. And he was visited by many members of our congregation, including yourself, Brian, and um, especially Aaron McKibben. I, I just wanted to single him out. He, Aaron visited many, many times. And um, Brock doesn't get a whole lot necessarily out of watching TV and stuff. So he was pretty bored, and it was very uh, uplifting for him to have visitors. Mm. Yeah, that's a great, great example. Debbie? I think we've got plenty of examples right here in our congregation, too. I know when Randy and I were sick at one point, we couldn't get out of the house for several days, and Ramona called and offered to go get us groceries and mm. brought them by, and I think she even paid for them. She wouldn't take yeah. any money. And you know, I know you've taken people into your home and mm. opened your home up to you know, have people stay with you that didn't have another place. And, mm. Joy has done that, and Cherie has done that. So sure. we, we have so many wonderful examples right here in our brother brotherhood, yeah. you know, well, brother and sisters that have extended kindness and put themselves out to, to make way for other people's unfortunate situations. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons I just feel so spoiled to be here at PSD. I have preacher friends that just don't have very good situations at their congregations. And I, I feel bad because I'm like, oh, I don't know what that's like. <laughs> like. I have a congregation that is kind and treats me well and treats each other well. And that's just such a blessing that we don't ever want to take for granted because not every congregation is like that. Some congregations have a lot of 
fighting and cruelty and not much compassion and tenderness and consideration of others. So let's always strive to keep that. Let's talk for the rest of our class about how we can develop more kindness in our lives. What are some practical ways to do that? All right, Ramona. Yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you for that. But um, I, I think of our firefighters. I mean, sure, it's a job. They get paid. But how many people really could do a job like that where they run into the fire? Mm -hmm. And up the stairs in 9-11, you know, sure. they, they, they knew what the danger was, but they went mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. And this is for, I believe, for the love of their, you know, fellow man. And Definitely. it just takes a certain kind of person. Same thing with the officers, the police officers, mm -hmm. and the people that go, go to war, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and how they rescue sometimes civilians and, and do really good things for them. It takes a certain kind of person to do that. It does, yeah. So how can we develop um, more of that kind of kindness um, in our own lives? Um, I've got one. Uh, well, I've got a lot. But uh, remember God's kindness toward you. All right. I love how David phrases it in the verse we read in 2 Samuel 9. He says, who in Saul's house can I show the kindness of God to? <laughs> he doesn't say, can I show my kindness, kindness to God? He knew how kind God had been to him in his life, and now he just wants to go and share and, and extend that you know, to other people. Uh, I don't see any hands, so I'll keep going with my examples, but raise your hand if you have something. Um, don't pick and choose who you show kindness to. Jesus called people out on that all the time. That it's very easy to show kindness only to the people who are kind to us or people that we like and you know click with or whatever. Jesus says, God is kind even to ungrateful and evil men. Therefore, be merciful as your Father is merciful. Um, all right, I'm, I'm going to keep rolling. All right, uh, pray for God to lift your gaze outside of yourself in your own life. Sometimes we don't. We're not kind to people because we don't even see them. We're so focused on what's going on in our own lives and all the stuff I got to do and take care of, and it's about me, me, me. And but just look up, right? Notice Lazarus sitting outside your gate, right? Um, let me let me give this one, and then I'll let you guys have the rest of the class because I really wanted to make sure to get this. One writer suggested in every situation to ask these two questions when we see someone in need. There are some hands here too. Uh, these two questions when you see someone in need. Number one, if I were Jesus, what would I do? Number two, if they were Jesus, what would I do? That story I told you about the prisoner giving his blanket to the other man, that's what he thought to himself. He was, I mean, he was wrestling. He wanted that blanket for himself. He was going to freeze to death. But he, he had the thought, if that man shivering in the corner, if that was Jesus shivering in the corner, what would I do? And he gave him his blanket. It's based on scripture. It's based on Matthew 25, where Jesus says, you know all those kindnesses that you showed to people throughout your whole life? You were actually being kind to me. That was me you were doing that for, even the least of these. Okay, the rest of the class is yours. We got a minute and a half for comments. Who's got the mic? Brian? Yeah, I think, um, especially in our internet-connected world, remembering that every interaction you have is another child of God. It's another person that is so easy to forget and if we realize that they all have struggles like we do they're all going through who knows what then it's much easier to have kindness towards them than just thinking of them as um an, an, an inanimate object essentially Definitely. which can happen yeah and there's something about being behind a screen and a keyboard that it loses our humanity with the people that we're talking to. We, you know, we, we get digital courage. That's how some people call it. The Bible would call it digital foolishness, right? We, we just lose our minds sometimes. Chris? And that. Yeah, I think we often get into this debate of, you know, when we're deciding to whether or not to do a kind act, is that person going to, to, to actually receive that act well? Are they Like if we're giving someone money, for example, are they really going to use it for what's intended? Uh, you know, but the truth is everything we have on this earth is from God, and anything we give is an extension of God's blessings. And so it's, 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 it's not ours to lose, and it's not ours to give. And yeah. we got to remember that, and I think that helps. Yeah, really good. One person was scammed out of money because a woman told, her, told him her baby was dying, and then he turned out later he found out that was a lie. And everybody thought he was going to be furious about it. And his response was, you mean to tell me there's not actually a baby dying? That's the best news I've heard all, all my life. I was like, that was an incredible response, right? <laughs> That's pretty cool. All right, Matt, you got the last word. Sorry, David. Uh, or, sorry, uh, Randy. We're out of time. Kind of 
piggybacks on that a little bit. Like the golden rule, of course, do unto others as we want. But let's take it to the next level. Do unto others as God has done to us. You know, why, why do we serve God? Is it because he threatened and said, you better behave or I'm going to smack you? No. Mm-hmm. God, we serve and love God because he loved us first. And it's unbelievable how merciful and kind he is to us. Yeah. Okay, then we probably should behave towards other people. If we want to bring other people to God, which is our number one goal, yeah. then Absolutely. kindness is yeah. going to do it. Harshness, yelling, well, you, you know, should have thought of that, that kind of stuff. That that's doesn't help anybody. Definitely. Really good. Yep. Great thoughts. Jesus says, I'll, I will draw all men to myself. <laughs> his, his cross, his kindness draws people in. We don't have to force people. Okay, so I do need to say this. There's a change to the syllabus for this coming Wednesday. We're going to talk about drunkenness. We're not going to talk about strife and disputes because that's too similar to enmities and anger and all the other stuff that we already covered. Drunkenness. All right, so think about social drinking. Think about that kind of stuff. We'll have that conversation on Wednesday night, Lord willing. Thank you.